quickly, but in the meantime, it gives me a chance to welcome you all and thank you, Jim and Diane, for that lovely introduction. I'm just delighted that we can welcome you to the Menninger Clinic and our new campus, which we are enjoying so much. But also, one of its nice features is to be able to host things like this. We didn't have room to do where we were before. So we love uh, being here and having you here. And this kind of workshop is only one of a whole series of programs. You know what heard Jim talk a little bit about. Um, he didn't mention that I had the good fortune last year when I was president of the American Psychiatric Association to um, give an award. We have only one award each year that we give to outstanding organizations uh, who provide service uh, to those in need. And, uh, we were able to present that, I was, to the NEABPD um, for the American Psychiatric Association. And it was really a wonderful opportunity for me to say thank you to that organization, which has been so hugely important in really advocating for the problems and the concerns of patients and families with borderline personality disorder. It's an area that I've been interested in really throughout my whole career, and I'm delighted to talk to you a little bit about it this morning and try to set the stage for this, just a rich day of learning that is clearly going to be uh, wonderful. So, much of this may be familiar to you, but it never hurts to review and go over how we understand conditions um, that we're trying to um, deal with in families that our patients uh, come in suffering from. And this is a graphic that comes from a book by John Gunderson, who's one of the leaders in the field um, as a clinician at McLean and Harvard. And what this shows is a I can do it on the screen. Okay, so else, and I'm not finding it. Um, so I'll just talk you through it. Um, the little circle in the center of this diagram is really reflecting the diagnostic manual concept of borderline personality disorder. Um, the oval that's called borderline personality organization is a theoretical concept that Otto Kernberg developed which applies to patients with BPD, but also to other kinds of patients with other personality disorders. For example, antisocial, uh, narcissistic, other disorders that are labeled in the book would be included in that broader category. But the main point to notice here is that these are in the middle of what in the early days were called the neuroses on the bottom, and what might be referred to as the psychoses on the top. <coughs> So the borderline conditions got the borderline part and that name from the idea that they were sort of in this borderland between sort of neurotic conditions that were less severely impairing and disabling and the psychotic conditions that were more disabling and impairing. That's where the word came from. Now, since then, we've learned uh, another way to think about this is they're sort of on a spectrum in the middle between the the neurotic kind of conditions that need help, but aren't so disabling and the psychotic conditions. And originally, borderline was thought to be on the schizophrenia psychosis spectrum. We know now that that is not true. And in fact, borderline uh, is not a schizophrenia spectrum disorder. A condition in the diagnostic manual called schizotypal personality disorder is what goes in that middle place on this slide if you showed it today. Borderline, on the other hand, still is on the border. And I often say that to families when they try to help people understand what it means. It's on the border of major mood disorders, and it's on the border of major impulse control disorders. So it's a different spectrum, but it's still a term that can be thought of and useful. The diagnostic manual of the American Psychiatric Association that we use today is DSM-4, the fourth edition. And the fourth edition has a set of criteria that define this disorder. Um, in our work in um, research, we call it a polythetic system, which means X number of a list of criteria out of the total Y number on the page, X out of Y, needs to be present to make the diagnosis. And for this condition, any five out of these nine criteria need to be present for the diagnosis to be made. Now that's a little artificial. Why did 
five get chosen instead of four or six. Actually, there were no data to support that choice. Uh, it was somewhat arbitrary. Five is more than half. Um, it also um, is important to notice that we talk about borderline personality disorder often, and you hear it talked about as if it's one thing. This is it. Well, it's not quite so simple because there are many varieties of borderline personality disorder. And if you can have any five on this list, you can see if you put various ones together, you would not have identical kinds of problems uh, from one to the next. And actually, if you do the math, there are 256 different official combinations of those non-criteria um, that one could come up with. So um, that's a little extreme, and one doesn't necessarily <coughs> go through that exercise. But the reason I say that and show it to you is that this is a family of conditions. It's a group of conditions, and things that you'll hear said about this condition may apply, but won't always apply. A good example of that is there's often a statement you'll hear that there's a history of trauma early in life in patients with this disorder, or neglect. That sort of immediately puts it in the lap of the families. Um, and that's unfair, number one, because many times the families are, in fact, doing the very best they can to cope with a very, very emotionally overcharged, developing um, child um, when the drive is really coming from the biology of the condition and not necessarily at all relating to the environment. Now, we know that there are terribly stressful <coughs> situations and there are times when people do uh, have bad luck and they're in families who are neglectful or who are broken or who are involved in drug use and so those are all real. And that is a very important factor, but it's not invariable and it's not at all uh, the defining uh, nature. Go back to this slide for a minute. This is a shorthand list, but you can see the main things have to do with um, a major problem in terms of interpersonal relationships, and that shows up all over the place. Trouble with self-image, who am I, what do I want in life, which way do I want to go, um, can I be on my own, can I be self-motivated and self-directed, or am I going to sort of fall apart unless I have somebody to guide me, that's that fear of abandonment. There's often an impulsivity, a tendency to be self-injurious. We'll talk a little bit more about that, just going into some more information. Emotional dysregulation is a very key and defining feature uh, of this condition. And then this feeling of nobody home. I just really don't know who I am. Intense anger is not at all uncommon. And that then is linked to this emotional uh, roller coaster that is often the case and impulsive uh, behavior. Sometimes you then see also suspiciousness and very, very strong difficulty trusting other people. How prevalent are these disorders? This is a big epidemiological study done by a Norwegian uh, epidemiologist, Sven Torgerson, and this lists uh, a whole list of disorders that have been in the diagnostic manual some of them are no longer in the main body of the diagnostic manual now, but have been there before. But if you pick the borderline, it shows a median prevalence of 1.6%. So that's between 1 and 2%, and that's what you generally see. That means in the general population out there, between 1 to 2% of people in the population will have this disorder. If you think about what is the prevalence of schizophrenia, about which we hear a lot and about which the National Institute of Mental Health funds an enormous amount of research. It's about 1%. So this is substantially more prevalent in the population. If you compare the amount of funding that will go into, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing, it's a good thing. We need funding to do research on schizophrenia, but it is light years more than what is available to study patients with borderline personality disorder, and that's one of those soapboxes I get on and try to preach from time to time. It doesn't exist by itself. The DSM-4 is what's called, as you know, a multi-axial manual, um, and the personality disorders are on what's called axis two. And the major um, 
groups of conditions such as mood disorders, psychoses, anxiety disorders, substance use disorders are all on axis one. And frequently, patients with borderline personality disorder have co-occurring conditions. And the most common are mood disorders or anxiety disorders or substance abuse disorders. This is one particular study that found that the mean number of axis one disorders uh, that patients had uh, was three, a little over three. So you have a very complex combination of challenges when you have this kind of condition that is more often the case than not. By the way, I may get to this later, but I'll do it now. So, so we have this DSM-4. We have all these major mental illnesses categorized on the main axis one. Do you know the two main categories that are on axis two? One of them you do, because I just told you it's the personality disorders. There's only one other, and that's mental retardation, which we now call intellectual disability. So why do you think the personality disorders and mental retardation were separated out and put in a different part of the book? Untreatable. Untreatable. You're absolutely right. Um, these, I think, you won't, you won't find this stated in the text, but I was there for a lot of these discussions about both DSM-3, 3R, 4, um, and I think that both of these categories, the personality disorder and mental retardation, were seen as life sentences and as things that you had for life. When the first sort of substantial diagnostic manual was done, 1980, DSM-3, that's when this multi-axial system was set up. That was right on the tail end of the psychoanalytic heyday that Diane was talking about. Back in the days when psychoanalysts uh, said, leave us alone, uh, you can't uh, talk to us. I'm a card-carrying psychoanalyst from Columbia where I was trained, so I can talk about that group comfortably. And that was a mistake, and that was in fact Partly, I guess, it's unfair to say that it was, it was a reflection of the times. Uh, and it, was a, it, was, it was where the theory was at the time. But the theory was that these were conditions, these personality disorders, that were what were called psychogenic. They weren't thought to have anything to do with heredity or biology, but were just thought to be like neuroses, just a reflection of um, bad luck and not having had the kind of supportive experiences growing up to enable you to be able to function well, but then were thought to be pretty much lifelong. Whereas mental retardation was thought to also be pretty much lifelong, but it was inherited and biological. So both of them were put there for that reason. I can tell you that the DSM-5, the next edition of the diagnostic manual, will not be multi-axial. Personality disorders will be one section on that same group with the mood disorders and the anxiety disorders, and it'll be no different. And there's absolutely no conceptual way you could argue otherwise at this point. I'll show you a little bit about that. I don't have to tell you this. Patients with this disorder have severe impairment in function. There is a childhood trauma history that you can commonly see, but not invariably by any means. The big trouble they have is trust in others, and that gets into this push-pull, um, enormous tension, where these are individuals who really can't do without other people, and they can't do with other people. And it becomes uh, a yo-yo back and forth. There are high levels of anxiety and distress. Interpersonal relationships are very stormy, often high family stress, difficulty keeping jobs, hyper-emotionality, and then sometimes self-injurious behavior. There is, in fact, high risk with this condition. Eight to 10% commit suicide. Back in that DSM-3 day, there was language in the text that said these patients um, often showed manipulative suicidal gestures, quote unquote. Terrible language. That's gone. 
but that was the way people thought in those days, that these are patients who willfully were injuring themselves to get your goat and to really get somebody else to behave in the way they want. And that's anything but the case. We know that self-injurious behavior is a desperate act that reflects the internal stress that these patients are feeling. And of course it has an impact on other people, but that's not the motivation for this. Eight to 10%, this is no gesture, actually suicide. That is a very high percentage. There are risk factors. I wrote an article in the American Journal of Psychiatry about this. And that's true for many uh, other conditions, such as depression, but the risk factors for patients with BPD for that suicidal um, high risk include prior suicide attempts, co-occurring mood disorders, very high levels of hopelessness. Sometimes there is a family history of suicide. And that's always a risk factor. Co-occurring substance abuse, because that contributes to the lack of control uh, of behavior. Sometimes there's a history of sexual abuse and high levels of impulsivity or antisocial traits. All right, so let's shift for a little bit and talk about what we know um, in terms of the neurobiology of this condition. And we know quite a bit. Larry Seaver and Tony New, Hal Konigsberg are researchers at Mount Sinai in New York. And they've taught us a lot about the neurobiology of these conditions. And two big parts of what we now know of what they call heritable endophenotypes. I think an easier way to think about it is just heritable risk factors. I had, a, um, I had a colleague in New York when I was at Columbia, Nancy Wexler, who was one of the researchers who um, was um, a key, key player in developing the uh, breakthrough knowledge about the genetic nature of Huntington's disease. It's a terrible disease. You may not be familiar with it, but it's one that has its onset in the 30s and 40s. Once often you've had your children, but it, it's, a, it's a genetic dominant condition, so that if both parents have the gene, all children will have it. But those children won't get it until they're 40, so they may have already had their children. So it's a very terrible disease. But she talks to people about genetic risk, um, and um, she talks about heritable factors and risk um, that exist in all of us. She used to say, um, I guess I will say this with a little trepidation, before the Accountable Care Act and the health reform, she used to say to an audience like this, it won't be too long until nobody in this room is insurable. And everybody would say, what do you mean? And she'd say, because you can't get insurance if you have pre-existing conditions. And we all have them. Everybody in this room has them. In my family, it may be depression that runs in the family. In yours, Jim, it may be borderline personality disorder. In yours, it may be hypertension. In yours, it may be diabetes. Everybody has a certain degree of higher risk for some conditions that runs in the family. But that doesn't mean you're going to get it. It's a risk vulnerability balancing act. And the way I often talk about it is just to use the example of adult onset diabetes. Let's say you've got two guys with identical moderate inherited risk to develop adult onset diabetes. One of them happens to be a natural athlete, fitness nut, stays in good shape his whole life. He never develops the illness. The other guy with exactly the same amount of risk, never exercises, is a couch potato, loves fried foods and desserts, gets overweight. He gets it. Well, the same principle applies for borderline personality disorder, for other conditions like depression, and for most medical conditions. And by the way, these are all, including borderline personality disorder, medical conditions that are, in this case, brain disorders. These are, though, two things that we've learned. This just shows you a little bit of what the brain looks like. And the main point is to look down on the bottom left, and you'll see a little word, the amygdala. That's a, weird word, 
but that uh, is a part of what's called the limbic system, which is the older part of the brain, which is known to be the place in the brain where emotions are sort of um, generated. There's a, usually a strong connectivity between that part and the sort of purple colored part on the left side of the slide called the prefrontal cortex. So the cortex is the newer part of the brain. And that's the part of the brain you use to um, keep those emotions under control. And so the reason I show you this is to help you understand that in normal people, that capacity to sort of slow down those emotions and keep them in a reasonable level of intensity is what we're all able to do. This is a study by the same group at Mount Sinai that demonstrated using brain imaging technology that patients with borderline personality disorder don't have that same strong connection between that prefrontal cortex and this emotion center. So what happens ordinarily, I just made this up as a schematic, you'll have a strong emotion, like some of you may have had the emotion this morning when you got up to say, what a nice day, why do I have to go to this stupid conference? <laughs> Maybe I'll sleep in. But your cortex kicked in and you said, cut it out, okay, get up, take a shower, and get here. The patient with borderline personality disorder has overactive emotions, but it's a double hit, because the brakes don't work. And that is so important to understand. Remember a while ago there was a, this news going around in the news about these Toyotas that had these runaway motors that you just didn't want to buy a Toyota because they were going to take you up, crashing into a wall. Well, sometimes that's an example. So you got the motor running hot to start with, and then the brakes don't work. So when you've got whatever the stress is, and it can sometimes be a seemingly trivial trigger that starts that emotional engine going and then you've got an overactive overcharged emotional state you have to understand that it doesn't do any good to say cut it out because the patient doesn't have the capacity biologically to do that you can't turn it off if you're in that state sometimes this is a progression that then leads to self-injurious behavior, which turns out to be one of the ways where you can kind of turn off that overcharge and get some relief. We would follow, find that painful to do that. These patients find that it in fact brings relief. These are conditions that are heritable. There are more and more studies of the heritability of borderline personality disorder. Uh, these are just some of them. Um, the most recent are the work, the, the work being done by Ken Kendler uh, who is a very uh, fine and respected genetics uh, scientist at the Medical College of Virginia. And he's studying through the Norwegian Twin Registry uh, the heritability of personality disorders and has begun to publish about that. But we think there are, as, as all psychiatric disorders, these are what are called polygenic. There are multiple genes that contribute to developing the disorder. And that's true for this disorder as well. So the genetic problem may show up in a number of different combinations and include different, different genes. Harold Konigsberg at Mount Sinai added one other thing here. So you see that affective instability, the emotional dysregulation that we talked about. You see the impulsivity, those two endophenotypes or heritable risk factors. And you see on the bottom that when they cut themselves, they don't experience pain. And we think there may be a biological basis for that that these patients have abnormal levels of what we call endogenous opioids, which means that the opioids are like uh, opioids or medications you will get to help you relieve pain. And we think that, in fact, they have different levels that make them less sensitive to pain. And then on the other side is relationship disturbances, and people have really viewed that as such a high and important feature of this disorder uh, that it, in fact, may be even a heritable phenotype by itself. Kind of some would argue that. Um, this is one study to demonstrate that the area that some people are researching, which is that the baseline endogenous, meaning sort of what you're born with, uh, levels of these 
um, opioid hormones um, may be abnormal, uh, and this may also relate to the negative emotions that these patients experience. There's another area people are looking at, which is quite interesting, called the neuropeptide model. I know all of you know that oxytocin is the hormone of attachment and bonding. That's the hormone that when a mother has a child during pregnancy begins to uh, increase in the mother's body so that when the child is born, this facilitates the bonding and the attachment between the mother and the infant. It's the bonding hormone. Um, in fact, it seems to be deficient in borderline patients. Another hormone that seems to be perhaps elevated in borderlines is vasopressin, which is a body chemical, a body hormone that is associated with aggression. This is one study. Um, it looks kind of complicated, but let me just try. I'm still looking for this. Oh, there it is. There it is. Okay. So look over here, and what you see is the light bars are healthy controls, and the dark bars, um, uh, I'm sorry, the, on the whole, oops, on the whole left side, you're seeing, um, I'm going to try to stop doing that. It's just, it's too hard to do. On the left side of the slide, uh, you'll see the healthy controls with the light and the dark bar and then next to it, borderline patients with a light and dark bar. And this is a computer-driven uh, test where patients are given what's called intranasal spray of the hormone oxytocin. So you give normal people intranasal spray of oxytocin, and then you see how effectively they're able to trust a hypothetical partner who's supposed to be in the next room participating as your partner in a computer game and they become better at it. They're better able to trust the partner next to it. Patients with this condition not only don't get better, they get worse after getting this. And on the right side was an even sort of ratcheting up the, the, the method by telling all the subjects, let me assure you that you've got a trustworthy partner next door, and if you cooperate with that person, you will be able to benefit. There will usually be a way you can earn theoretical money together if you do this game right. It didn't matter. Borderline patients still couldn't trust the person next to them. So it's just an interesting uh, finding. Um, this was a study in, published in Science, a very highly rigorous uh, scientific journal. Uh, Brooks King Casas was the first author, but the second author is Peter Fonagy. And Peter, as you know, is one of the uh, uh, really architects of the mentalization-based uh, therapy and the concept of mentalization that John Allen's going to tell you about uh, in a few minutes. And this was a really interesting study, um, again, using that kind of computer simulation game. And in essence, the finding, the bottom line, was that they found areas of abnormality in the brain using brain imaging that seemed to correlate with the inability to really um, recognize appropriate social gestures, recognize um, how to trust other people. And this is consistent with other work that's been done showing patients with borderline personality disorder photographs of faces with different kinds of expressions on their faces. Some of them are entirely neutral faces, and the average population would look at it and say, I don't see any, anything but just the average face there. Patients with borderline will see hostility in a face that nobody else sees. I put it together this way um, to show that sort of bi-directional arrow connecting this insecure attachment with those heritable risk factors. So, what I mean by that is you can have that bad luck of having landed in a family that is fractured, fragmented, and neglectful, or even abusive. And when that happens, you've got a high load of derailment going on in the attachment process that needs to happen so that a child learns to trust an adult. 
doesn't work very well. So if there's even a moderate degree of heritable risk, that high traumatic environment will deliver to illness. If on the other hand, you've got pretty good support, very capable parents, and a family that does the best it can, it can but a huge heritable risk on the bottom, you get the same result. So it's a mix, it's not always the same. Okay, so what happens over time? This is interesting. Um, if you think about the longitudinal course of these conditions, um, I'll show you in a minute one of the defining features of the personality disorders in general is that they are stable and enduring over time. That goes back to that notion that they're untreatable and that they're life sentences. So we really have a theoretical notion about that. We really didn't have strong data. And we now do, because there's been an NIMH-funded grant that's now been funded continuously for about 15 years. And some of the 10-year data have been published. I was part of this grant uh, group that was doing this at the Columbia site when I was in New York, and I've been very interested in it all along. There were five collaborative sites um, at Brown and Columbia, Harvard, Yale, and at first it was Vanderbilt and now Texas A&M. But we had four different personality disorders that we studied. Now this is what's called a, a naturalistic study. So it's not a treatment study. It's a study you just identify carefully using the diagnostic manual. These are patients with these conditions, and they've enrolled in this study, and, we, and have agreed to commit to come back every six months for years. And we do structured, standardized evaluations every six months. Are they in treatment? Almost always. Yes and no. Inpatient sometimes, outpatient. That's not being measured. All we're doing is measuring how you do over time. A similar longitudinal study was done about schizophrenia that taught us a lot about the natural course of the illness. Another one was done about major depression. So that's what this study did. Now, if you're following um, patients, and we had schizotypal 86 patients, 175 with borderline, 158 with obsessive compulsive personality disorder. And 158 with avoidant and 154 with OCPD. By the way, our control group was major depressive disorder, which had to be without co-occurring personality disorders. Oh. Guess which group was the hardest one to find? Without. <laughs> we scratched up 95 of them, but it was the hardest one to find. People don't do that. When you're studying mood disorders, they don't, they don't evaluate the personality disorders. And believe me, they should. Because if they're there, it makes a difference in how the patient's going to do in treatment. And that's a major flaw in a lot of the literature out there. You've got one study studying depression and a treatment for it, and you've got another one, and they don't, they don't replicate. If you didn't look at axis 2, you may have whole different populations. Uh, and a lot of times that's a problem. So we're following these patients longitudinally. They all come in with, just let's talk about the borderline group for a minute. They all come in with borderline PD. If so we're going to follow them over time, one of the things we're going to be interested in is, are these, is this borderline personality disorder stable and enduring over time? Or do patients with this disorder show what we call remission? Do they get better? We talk about remission of depression. You have a major depressive episode, you get treated, the episode remits, and you get better. So how are we going to define remission? How would you do it? Anybody? Okay, that's exactly the, the, the logical way to do it. You say, okay, you're required to have five criteria, you no longer have five criteria. Mary Zanarini at McLean has done what's called the McLean Longitudinal Study, looking at longitudinal course using that definition and shows that, in fact, it's not very stable over time, unlike the way we've defined it. But our argument was, we don't think that's good enough, because patients will have 
good times and bad times. And so they'll sometimes come in and say, yeah, I know I said that last time, but I was really in a bad state then. And that's not really how, what I'm like. Um, and this may be a time when they're in a honeymoon period with a new partner and the world looks good. <laughs> so they'll say it different. So I mean, if they just say, well, I've only got four of these criteria, is that person really all better than remitted? We didn't think so. So we said, let's set the bar really high. We're going to say remission is for all these patients who came in meeting five or more, and the average actually median number of criteria met for our patients with borderline was seven. We say we're going to have no more than two criteria for a solid year. So that's setting the bar pretty high. You'll be surprised what we found. Defining it that way, 85% have remitted in 10 years. So the definition of this disorder, that it's stable and enduring over time, is wrong. These patients get better. Now, what does this reflect? What it reflects is more the shedding of some of the most symptomatic behavior, such as suicidal gestures, suicidal ideation, self-injurious behavior. Over time, these patients learn to get beyond that. But what doesn't change as quickly is how well they're functioning in the world. And that's that blue bar on the bottom. So it's a much slower change rate. The other bars are major depressive disorder and other personality disorders combined. Borderline is the worst player in terms of getting back to functioning. So that teaches us that what we need to really prioritize in our work with patients is helping them be able to get back into life, to be able to get a job and keep it, to be able to relate to people, not to sort of isolate themselves. Because those are areas that are big challenges for these patients. OK, what do we know about treatment? I was fortunate to chair the American Psychiatric Association practice guideline evidence-based work group uh, with great colleagues like Glenn Gabbard and John Gunderson and many others. And this is the only practice guideline that's evidence-based of the APA that demonstrates through evidence that psychotherapy is the core primary treatment of choice. Um, pharmacotherapy is helpful if it's low-dose, time-limited, symptom-targeted. But you don't treat this condition with medications as a primary treatment over time. Now, if a patient has borderline condition and bipolar disorder that co-occur, you've got to treat the bipolar disorder, and that's going to need medication. So that's not what I'm meaning here. There are lots of treatments. You're going to hear from John about mentalization. That's a really important one. But you know dialectic behavior treatment has been an enormously helpful form of treatment as Marshall and Henry. When we did the practice guidelines, it was back in 2001, over 10 years ago, and at that time, we had the Linehan DBT study, and we had just in time had the Fomagene Bateman minimization based therapy studies. We didn't think there was any single type of study that was going to be the, the only thing that worked for these patients. We thought what was important was to be in psychotherapy and stick with it long enough over time for it to make a difference. And now there are published randomized controlled trials for every one of these kinds of treatment that show that they are helpful and effective for patients with this disorder. The trick is to finding somebody who knows how to do the treatment, number two, who's willing to treat patients with borderline PD, and number three, where there's a way for it to be paid for, and number four, for the patient to stick with it. And those are tall challenges in this whole process. There are other studies that are out there. The UK and London has done a study, um, which shows pretty much the same thing as our study did. There's also an Australian um, clinical practice guideline for borderline that has just been finished. It was open for comment until May. 
And they showed the same thing, a range of therapies that are effective. They had a couple of others uh, that are common over there. And pharmacotherapy did not appear to be effective in altering the nature of the course of the disorder. So common features of recommended treatment are shown here. If not brief, we don't have a quick fix. There's a strong alliance and a hierarchy of really a mix of empathic validation with the need to help the patient learn to control this impulsive behavior um, as well. Um, we also looked at collaborative, in a collaborative study, what patients came in telling us. And they came in telling us that the borderline spike is the tallest one. They were the biggest heavy hitter in terms of the history of treatment, in terms of the history of hospitalization. And also, this is a different slide, but it just shows that patients with borderline personality disorder, after you control for co-occurring depression, had received more antidepressant medications than patients with major depressive disorder. And these patients have had polypharmacy thrown at them over and over, and they will come in on multiple boatloads of medications, um, but that's not the solution. There are lots of other studies that have been done that demonstrate that um, pharmacotherapy is not the primary treatment, so it can be helpful. Mood stabilizers seem to look like they may be more helpful for symptom-targeted help. But the good news is that borderline is treatable, treatment works, and with good treatment and enough time, patients get better. Here's what I say. You need a strong therapeutic alliance, availability of skilled therapists, funds and insurance company, and time. Um, look at that headline at the top in the middle, borderline personality disorder that doctors fear most. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Time Magazine. It really helps us with the stigma of this condition. Um, that's what you find too often. Okay, now I'm going to take maybe five minutes and still have another ten minutes for questions, all right, Jan? Just to tell you about, which I don't have time to do justice to, uh, an interesting drama that's been going on with regard to DSM-5. Actually, let me back up and say one other thing, because I think some of you will have heard me say this. John's heard it until he's sick of it, but um, I want to say something about that last bullet, number four here, time. So we used to get family workshops here, and we had families come in for patients who were here being treated. And so I would talk to them about this. So the example I'll just go through really quickly is, if, if, if all of you just think for a minute about, well, for me, it would be a long time ago, maybe not for most of you, back when you were in college, Okay, and you had a tough, big exam that you had to, you had to pass. So you pulled an all-nighter, you crammed for it. I'm seeing some recognition here. Most of us remember something like that. And you ended up doing okay, right? You passed the exam. Anybody remember that? Okay, so tell me how much you remember about what you learned. <laughs> You get, the, you get the point. You get the point. We, we don't, you don't remember that. This is called short-term retention. We need it to live. You needed it to figure out how to get here this morning when you had the address. You need it to know what you got to go shopping for in the grocery store this afternoon. But that doesn't get stored in your brain. That's, that's processed biologically. It's what's called at the synapse, biochemically, between nerve cells. Long-term learning and memory changes the brain. And we now know that. So it leads to enrichment of connectivity among brain cells. And it also does one other thing we never used to think was possible. It stimulates new brain cells at all stages of life, all the way into late life. This is possible. So that would have been science fiction when I was trying. Now, what can stimulate growth of new brain cells? Guess what? Psychotherapy, all by itself. If it's done right, it's a form of learning and memory. 
So the best analogy I can think of is think of it like learning a second language rather than cramming for an exam. It's no wonder you can't have a few drop-in sessions of psychotherapy and not have it stick. If you learn a second language, you've got to work at it. You've got to go back. You've got to practice. You're going to forget half of what you learned or more until you practice over and over. And it's going to take time. We think we're fortunate here at Menninger because we can have the luxury of people staying here six to eight weeks. And we think that gives us time to start this process and get it going. And then we hope it'll stay going after people leave you. Uh, the average length of stay in psychiatric hospitals in the country is about five days, six days. I call it Band-Aid treatment. When you're bleeding, you need a Band-Aid. It's helpful. It's important. But it doesn't do what we need long term. Okay. DSM-5. This was the work group. I was a member of the work group for DSM-5. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, I will tell you the bottom line in a minute. But we developed a model that we were proposing. And this isn't even the most recent version of it. But in essence, we, we revise things in general for personality disorders. And this is particularly for borderline. But it's the general definition would apply to all the personality disorders. And the way we actually put it in the final model is that um, we're focusing on the core defining features of a personality disorder, which are impairments in functioning, in a sense of self, that is, who I am, what I want out of life, how I'm going to direct myself, my autonomous capacity to really be self-directed and solidly sturdy on my feet in terms of being able to go forward in life. So that's significantly impaired in these patients. And then the second major area is impairment in interpersonal functioning. And those are the two main defining features. Then we have a set of pathological personality traits that are different for one personality type from another, personality disorder from another. Um, but there, it's a way of zeroing in on those enduring traits that impair functioning. Where you saw that slide where borderline was the blue bar on the bottom. Um, and that's an area that we think is much more um, um, critical in defining these disorders. So originally we had a kind of a um, model that then we um, proposed for all the disorders. And the borderline would read like this, the prototypic features of BPD are instability of self-image, personal goals, interpersonal relationships, and ethics, accompanied by marked impulsivity, risk-taking, hostility, characteristic difficulties are apparent in identity, self-direction, empathy, and or intimacy. Those are the two self and two interpersonal uh, features that we unpacked a little bit along with specific maladaptive traits. So for borderline personality disorder, we spell that out. And I'm not going to belabor this, but you have it in your handout. Um, just describing how these look in borderline patients. And you'll find that there's a correlation with the language in DSM-4 that's pretty high. So the language is very familiar. Um, and this is what the impairment in their personal functioning looks like. And then there are pathological personality traits, a whole bunch of them in a category called negative affectivity. And that's just sort of that heritable factor that these patients have, leading to emotional dysregulation or ability, a lot of anxiety, separation or abandonment insecurity, and moodiness or depression. Impulsivity is an aspect of disinhibition, which is a trait domain, and risk-taking is another, and finally, hostility and anger. So those are similar words, but it's formatted in a way and structured around pathological inherited traits and impairment in functioning and a sense of self and interpersonal relations. So we think that's a really important way. In fact, we have done some field trials looking at test-retest reliability Borderline had a better test retest reliability than um, generalized anxiety disorder, major depressive disorder, schizophrenia, 
uh, and very close to bipolar disorder. That surprised everybody, but it was in fact very reliably used as a diagnosis. Um, the, this, I made this talk, these slides were made before last week, so I sent them to Jim before last week, so I don't have the slide that I would put on here if I did a new version, which would tell you that last week on Monday, the proposal to put this model in DSM-5 was disapproved by the American Psychiatric Association. And I'm a former president of it, and a member of the work group, and I will tell you I did the best I could. <laughs> so that is a long story, and if we had the rest of the day, I could tell you about that. It's been an interesting process. So the DSM-4 system that's in DSM-4 will be sustained and put in DSM-5 unchanged as the system. Now, it's not all bad because we're all used to it and it correlates very well with the model we're proposing. The model we're proposing will be in the book, but it'll be in what's called Section 3, which is the new term for what in DSM-4 is called the appendix. And it'll be those things that are really proposed for further study. Um, the field of psychiatry wasn't quite ready for this. Um, it's too clear. <laughs> <laughs> you said it. <laughs> and I could say more. I, I, I will say that I'm, I'm personally very disappointed because I think this is a wrong decision. And I am a member of the Board of Trustees and I expressed my dissenting opinion strongly to the Board, um, but we did not prevail at this point. DSM-5 is an algebraic number instead of a Roman numeral <laughs> on purpose so that it can become what's called a living document. And there will be a 5.1, 5.2, 5.3, and it won't be another 20 years until we get a new edition. So I'm optimistic that we will use this, it's in the book, people will study it, get more familiar with it. Because I think it really does help us. And we actually, in the field trials, have a lot of data from clinicians who have used it. And they found it far preferable to DSM-4, um, even though they'd been using DSM-4 for 20 years. And this was unfamiliar, but they liked it better. But it was too late to really make it happen that way. So the only thing I'll conclude with is one of my favorite slides. She's saying to him, why are you the way you are? <laughs> and the reason I say that and show this is she's not saying to him, why do you have what you have? There's a personality disorder the way you are. Doing life sentence, you got it for life. Or is it what you got? Something caused it. And maybe if something caused it, something could make it go away. And the best answer I can give is a little of both. We have these heritable traits. They're there. But look, we have risk factors for other things that we live with. People have asthma. They have it for life. We learn to live with it. We have traits of emotional, more emotionality than other people. If we can, in fact, tailor the treatment right, patients can do great over time. It doesn't mean it has to all go away. Some of that's going to stay and persist. And we need to understand that. So let me stop there. Thanks. Kind of makes you glad you got up this morning. Uh, okay, we have uh, maybe about five minutes for questions. And uh, if you have them, right on the card. Any cards? Oh, okay. Okay, I'll start while they're collecting others. How does the issue of mistrust in those with borderline compared to the issue of mistrust in those with paranoid disorder? Um, that's a very good question. Um, anybody hear that? So actually, as you remember, that ninth criterion was episodes of um, 
suspiciousness or even a dissociative episodes that can happen. If you have a primary diagnosis of paranoid personality disorder, first of all, I will tell you that we had proposed to um, decommission the term paranoid personality disorder and put it under a category called personality disorder trait specified. So that we don't think there's a good case to be made for the validity of this term, paranoid personality disorder, or schizoid, or histrionic, or dependent, as freestanding diseases or illnesses. We view them as prominent traits that can happen across lots of different conditions um, in greater or smaller amounts. But if you do have what now would be still defined as paranoid personality disorder, that is what you've got, and that is persistent over time. And it's more extreme. It's at a higher level of mistrust. Mistrustfulness is not paranoia. It goes in that direction, but it's not the same. Paranoia is really being convinced, close to almost being delusional, that the world is out to get me, and I've got to be very cautious and protect myself, and I have 41 locks on my door, and I've got shotguns at the front door because I'm going to be in trouble. And that's not at all the extreme that someone with this condition will show. So it's a, it's a matter of quantitative difference to some degree, and also when patients with this condition have that level of mistrust, that can lead into episodes of being almost paranoid. It's usually time limited. It's under high stress, and then it, it cools down afterwards. Next. Well, this is just quick. Heritability versus? Heritability yeah. versus inheritability, same thing. Yeah. Different words. Things are heritable, or you inherit them. Just different words for the same thing. Uh, OK. Uh, has there been any uh, work or study done uh, with amino acid therapy to improve uh, the uh, synthesis or the support of neurotransmitters such as dopamine serotonin? Um, people are playing around with that. Uh, nothing has really shown a lot. Um, 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 alpha lipoic acid is one thing that people have been looking at, which is sort of an fish oil, uh, and that seems to be remarkably beneficial. Mary Santolini, actually, is one of the uh, Harvard McLean uh, people studying borderline, has published a, one study that showed that that might be beneficial. Um, whether that's going to play a prominent and meaningful, unique role in this condition, or it's sort of good for the body and would be good for anybody, um, is what people haven't sorted out yet. It's an interesting thing to look at. Okay, question on studies of uh, BPD in uh, childbearing, uh, specifically uh, regarding uh, oxytocin levels, uh, uh, especially during pregnancy, breastfeeding. I don't know how deep the studies have gone on this. Do you have anything even anecdotal to come in? Um, not, not really. That's, that's at a level of study that just hasn't been done. Most of the studies of this actually have been in the basic science world using animal models. Uh, Hum Ensel at NIMH has done a lot of really interesting studies looking at um, a little animal that looks like a mouse that's called a prairie vole. And there are two different types. One is a bonding type that bonds uh, uh, for life with a mate. And the other is highly promiscuous. And the highly promiscuous type has a different set of genes and has far lower oxytocin levels than the type that bonds for life, and they have very much higher oxytocin levels. But it's not been something that would be easy and has been studied actually in humans, uh, uh, mothers with this condition. Um, but there is a lot of interest in it from the point of view of normal mothers and variability in that level uh, and how well the attachment process goes on and actually a lot of interest in that, but it's it's a pretty uh, developing area that's, that's not extensive at this point. Okay, uh, we, did, we just run over a minute or two, but BPDs, can they hit rock bottom, then make a change? Uh, you know, I, I hear that uh, you have to hit rock bottom before uh, things can get better. Uh, I think that's... Well, you know, it's interesting. Point. We, we hear that a lot in the substance abuse world. 
So if you've got an alcohol problem, often it seems to get there. You've got to really just burn out and really take your life down before you can get it back together. Um, that's not invariable by any means, but it's something that it's a story you hear and that people in AA will hear from others. And you hear that from some families and some patients um, will get perspective on it and recognize that it had to get to such an extreme. Um, if any of you read the, and I'm sure many of you did, the above the fold front page story about Marsha Linehan, when she talked about her own life, it's pretty sobering. And if you haven't read it, I highly recommend that you do so. As you know, she was the founder of DBT. And she, in fact, and I knew for years that she had had borderline personality disorder because I have known her for many, many years and had observed this, the cut marks on her arm. Um, she got in the habit of wearing long sleeves later on. But then she rolled them up big time uh, with this reporter and talked about how she had bought them. And so sometimes that is what happens. I don't think it's inevitable. I don't think it has to happen. And I think the biggest goal is to find Keep at it. A therapist who's, who understands the illness. I think our biggest enemy here is lack of understanding of this condition. One of the biggest, I'll stop with this because we're out of time. I'm, I'm cheating with John here. Um, one of the biggest recommendations that rolled into the DSM-5 group, and I was personally responsible for reviewing all public comments that came in, and there were thousands of them, on borderline, and the biggest recommendation was to change the name yes. and change it from borderline. Yes. Now, it's hard to find an alternative name that is a better one. The most frequently recommended was emotion dysregulation disorder. I personally would not be in favor of that, and we're not going to do it. Um, and I'm not in favor of it for two reasons. When you change the name, it doesn't change the illness. And so if we think that would help, it would be transient, I believe. And you'd have the headline that would say, just don't send me any more patients with emotion dysregulation disorder. <laughs> um, because the illness is what we don't understand. And we have to help people understand that you don't want to blame the victim here. We want to help people understand that this is not willful, difficult oppositional behavior. This is driven illness. The second reason I don't want to do that is that when you hear emotion dysregulation, what does the world of healthcare medicine want to do to that? They want to medicate it. Hey, the moods are out of whack. I'll give you this mood stabilizer. I'll give you this medication. And I think that would just work against us because that's not going to help. So I'll stop there.